Lord Jesus, we thank you today that you said that when two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. And Lord, we thank you that you are here by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, you know, about everything that we face. You know the details of our lives. <clears throat> you know the ups and the downs and the troubles, the burdens that we carry. Lord, we thank you today that you do not come as an accuser. You do not come as a critic or as one that condemns. But Lord, we ca you come as ever, Prince of Peace, bright morning star. You come as our Savior, as our Lord, as the one that said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lord, even though, as your word says, when we are faithless, you are still in the faith, in, in the face of our unfaithfulness. You are faithful. Oh, we give you praise, Jesus. We give you honor and glory, Jesus. We worship your name because there is none like you, Jesus. There is nobody that we know that even can come near, who can compare with you, Lord. There is nobody like you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We thank you for it. We rest in it today. We revel in it. We're secure in it. And Lord, we just thank you for being here with us. And all God's people said, Woohoo! That's what I said. Woohoo! Amen. You can be seated. Let's give our musicians a wonderful encouragement, round of applause. What a blessing they are to us. Wonderful. Do you know, I came here this morning with a word on my heart, and um, I was ready to, to speak it, to encourage you with it, but uh, it looks like we're not going to be doing that one this morning. Because, you know, uh, as pastor here, it's important that I am always aware of really what Jesus wants to say. And um, if he wants to make any changes at all to what I have to say, listen, I am more than willing for him to make those changes. And, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of message I have. I tell you, his message and his word in its simplicity has to rule the day because he wants the best for our lives. Amen? Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. It doesn't matter what storm we go through. It doesn't matter what issues we face. It doesn't matter how difficult the day may seem. When the Prince of Peace walks into the midst, everything's going to change. It doesn't matter if there's sickness in your body and you're worried about that. It doesn't matter if the finances are low and the debt collectors knocking at the door. When the Prince of Peace walks into the midst, when you become aware of the Prince of Peace standing at your side, fear goes. Fear has to leave. One time in the Old Testament when the people were under terrific pressure, God's people were under terrific pressure, and there were lots of circumstances and situations going on. God came to them with a word by his prophet. And he said, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? And before Jeremiah could answer the question, God answered it for him. And he said, there is nothing too difficult for me. When you understand and when we understand that he is the Lord, the God of all flesh. And that there's nothing too difficult for him. We gain our security again. All of the worries and the fears and the questions of our minds seem to fade away and dissolve. In the security of knowing that there's nothing too difficult or hard for him to do. 
Maybe today you're, you're, you're wondering whether God's going to answer, whether this situation's going to back off or this circumstance is going to get any easier. I want to tell you there's nothing too difficult for him. Find the strength and the security that you need again in those words from the mouth of Jeremiah. He's the God of all flesh. There's nothing too difficult for him. Every time, every time God's people have faced a circumstance or a situation or a crisis that's caused them to back off and bow down to fear, God has come with a, with a fresh word of revelation, a fresh unveiling of who he is toward his people. There's nothing to worry about. Now in our day, and in our time, that seems a ridiculous statement to make. But for the believer, for the person that loves Jesus, for the person that, that is in Christ, there is nothing to fear, there is nothing to worry about. There's nothing to be concerned about because God is for you. Who can be against you? Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You're more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthens you. You can do all things through him. Through Jesus. These are the words. And not just words or empty promises. These are the living words that God wants to shape all of our lives by. Be still, he says. Be still. And know that I'm God. Don't be troubled by the voices and the bites that take a chunk out of your confidence. And the, and the accusing voices that want to bring you down. Don't be worried. Don't even respond to those things. Be still. Be still. One translation of that word still is the word relax. A modern day translation is chill out. <laughs> chill out. Don't worry. Be still. Because I'm God. You know, there's lots of things that we pick up every day. Worries and cares and fears that we pick up. They just come our way. And before we know it, our mind's going here, there, and everywhere. And we're confused and we, we're torn apart and torn in two. And our, our, our hopes and our dreams and our trust is broken down and broken apart. Maybe something hits our family. Maybe something comes into our future and says it's going to be this way and it's not lining up with the hopes and the dreams and the aspirations that you had. There's things all day long to keep you worried. There's things all day long to keep you under the heel of fear. But God says, no, be still. Know that I am God. Know that I am the Lord. Another occasion through the mouth of the prophet Isaiah God said to his people, again, they were struggling. They were, they were striving. They were running here, there, and everywhere to try and gain control. And God said to them, fear not. Fear not. Why did he say fear not? Because they were full of fear. Full of fear. And it's hard. When you're, when you're facing real fears in your mind, when you're facing real pressing fears in your life, it's hard when God comes with a corrective, instructive word, fear not, Dave, I'm afraid. I need help. Through the prophet Isaiah, he said, fear not, says the Lord, for I am with you. What a wonderful, wonderful security to have. What a wonderful confidence to face life with. What a wonderful understanding to enjoy. I'm not going to fear because I really do believe that God is with me. When you get up tomorrow and you've got the Monday morning blues, tell me why I don't like Mondays. I can tell you a lot of whys I don't like Mondays. But you know what? Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. And he, then he goes on to say this. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. When you walk through the water, you shall not drown. He was talking about all of those queuing circumstances that were in front of them. All of those crises that they were going to have to face as they went forward into their future. 
And he says, listen, no matter what comes your way, because I'm with you, you don't have to fear the fire of a trial. You don't have to fear the fire of a circumstance. I'm with you. I'm with you. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. When you walk through the fire, the flame, you will not be burned. And you'll not be overcome by the waters of trial and circumstance and crisis. Don't be afraid. No, he is. He is the Prince of Peace. And he wants to come this morning, no matter where we are, what condition we are in, emotionally, physically, in our lives. He wants to say, listen, peace be unto you. I remember one day pushing Daniel in the park. And um, it was early morning. I'm pushing him on the swing. And I had all of these fears in my mind. And they were very real. Talking and speaking and very aggressive. And you feel beat up. You feel worn down. You feel physically and emotionally drained. I don't know if you've ever had that where fear has been so strong and, and it's been such a, a loud voice ringing in your ears, you can't stop it. You can't, you can't silence it, but it won't let you go. And you run here to just try and get a bit of relief and for an hour or two, you get a bit of relief. And then once you get beyond where you've gone, suddenly it's back, it's hounding you. And you go here, there, and everywhere just to find a little moment of relief. And you get your moments of relief here, there, and everywhere. But it won't let you go. It's hunting you down and you're haunted by it. And I remember saying to God as I'm pushing Daniel on the swing. I said, oh God, please give me peace. Please give me peace. And the Lord quietly, you know, you've heard that voice like I've heard it. That little still small voice. He said, no, I'm not going to give you peace. I'm not going to give you peace. And I quickly came to my senses and I thought, my God, what, what do you mean you're not going to give me peace? And then he said this. He said, you wanted to get my attention. He said, no, I'm not going to give you peace. I'm going to give you perfect peace. Just one word makes a big difference. You're not just going to get peace. You're not just going to get momentary peace. I'm going to give you perfect peace. And he reminded me of the scripture where it says, He whose mind is stayed and fixed on Jehovah is kept in perfect peace. Maybe today, maybe today, you need help like I needed help with the, by the Holy Spirit to fix my mind again on the Lord. On the Lord. My mind was wandering here, there, and everywhere. It was like fear was sat in the driving seat, and my mind was being driven here, driven there, all to the wrong places, and leaving me with a troubled, heavy heart to the point where I was in the park pushing my son, and everything looked fine on the outside, but inside I was breaking apart. I said, Oh God, give me peace. No, son. I'm not going to give you peace. I'm going to give you perfect peace. Today, perfect peace is your portion. It's your portion because Jesus has paid the price to give you that peace. He really has. That's why he did what he did. That's why he bled and died on the cross so that you could have wonderful peace in your heart. The peace that you long for, the peace that you search for, the peace that you ache for. I tell you something now, you can fill a hundred banks full of money, but if you don't have peace, the one thing that we need is peace. All of the money, we can enjoy it, fantastic, wonderful. We can bless people, we can be blessed ourselves. Nothing wrong with it. But that in and of itself will never meet the need, the longing of our heart and the peace that we so desperately search for. I want to read to you from John chapter 20. 
And this is the occasion that the Lord reminded me of this morning that he wants to bring to our attention. Jesus had risen from the dead. It was a Sunday morning when Mary had run into the tomb. The stone had been rolled away. And she'd looked into an empty tomb. She'd found his, his, his clothes lying there. Because God did what he said he would do. He rose from the dead. And Mary is frantically looking around for the body of Jesus because they loved him so much and they saw him so brutally killed. She didn't know where he was. She's running about. And then the gardener comes. She thinks it's the gardener. Of course, it's Jesus. And he asks a question. He says, who are you looking for? And she doesn't recognize him. And she, she says, oh, I'm looking for my Lord Jesus. If you've taken his body, please tell me where you've placed it. And then he says, Mary. And suddenly... She realizes who it, who, who it is. She realizes it's Jesus. With that, she tries to, to, to embrace him. And then she's, he's gone. He leaves. Then she's on her way back to tell the disciples. They can't believe it. Peter and John go racing towards the tomb. They find it just as Mary had said it was. Jesus has risen from the dead. Again, they are in a dilemma whether to believe it's real or whether not to. Because it's so incredible. The tomb is empty. And then Sunday evening comes. And that's where we're going to pick up on from verse 19 through to verse 23. Sunday evening. They're in a room and the doors are locked because of fear of the Jews. This was a room full of disappointment. Have you ever been disappointed with yourself? Have you ever felt that you failed God? We all have. These men were in a room and the room was full of disappointment. Because they had failed Jesus. They had promised Jesus that they would never leave him. They had promised Jesus that they would stay with him until the end. Peter, in fact, just a few days before, had promised that, that he would even die with Jesus if that's what it took. And yet it was Peter that betrayed Jesus, or denied Jesus, sorry, three times. And they'd all forsaken him. None of them could do what Jesus had done. None of them could walk the walk that that Jesus had walked, and when the pressure was on, they'd all left him. It was a room that was full of disappointment, a room full of failure, a room full of fear. The doors were locked. What were the Jews going to do to us? They'd killed Jesus. The next step was they'd come after his disciples. So there were so many pressures and worries in this room, on this night, the Sunday evening that they met, the doors were locked. And now, with, with those fears that they were feeling, that were very real. Imagine Jesus doing something so notable in our midst that the whole city rises up against it. And you feel the pressure to back off. You feel the fear that people around you don't want the purposes of God to go forward. You feel as if your life has a target on its back. This is how these men felt. They were really afraid. And with that fear was the added fear. Well, what's Jesus going to say to us? If Jesus is going to, you know, if Jesus has risen from the dead, what what are the words that he's going to speak to us? Because we've failed him. We've sinned. 
We've done something that we shouldn't have done. These men were ashamed of the way that they had lived. With the doors locked, suddenly Jesus is in the room. How does he do that? Right in the middle. And the first thing he says to them, let's read it. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst. And he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, no long sermon. No great speech of victory. I've conquered the grave. I went into hell. I endured the cross. I ascended to heaven. No. No great speech. He's not trying to gain a claim for himself. Doesn't need to. He's the reigning, ruling Lord. And he walks into the midst. No great speech. Peace, he says, be with you. When he had said this, he showed them. Here's the message. Here's the sermon. You want to see it, boys? Here's the sermon. He showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Oh, my God. What a moment that must have been. What an encounter. Can you imagine that? Having seen Jesus crucified on the cross. Having seen him undergone so much beating and whipping. And unimaginable circumstances coming upon him. Crucified. Hearing him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then taking his body down off the cross. The soldiers gambling for his clothes. Such a dishonorable moment. Such a terrible, dark time that they would never be able to get out of their minds. And then the next time they see him, for the first time, he says, peace. Peace be with you. And then he shows them his hands, his feet, his side. And they were so glad that the Lord was with them. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Jesus walks into this situation not as an accuser, not as one that's bringing up all of the past that, that, had, that had gone on, Jesus wasn't bringing up all of the failure, all of the things that, that they had been involved in. No, Jesus just walks into the midst as their savior. He can see that they're anxious. He can see that they're fearful. He can see that the one thing that they need is peace. And he had come to give it to them. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is not gonna hold that peace that you need from you. He is not going to allow you to live a life where you feel insecure. He's not going to allow you to live a life where you're wondering what's going to happen. No, he's going to give you a security whereby you can run and not grow weary. Run and not grow weary. You can go forward into everything that he's called you to go 
Worry slows you down. It wearies you. It's, it impedes your pace of life. No, the Prince of Peace is going to put strength into your feet again so that you can run for him. You can run and pursue and achieve the plans and the purposes that he's got for you. Run. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not grow faint. Fainting under worry and burden and fear and not knowing what's going to happen. No, you're going to walk and not grow faint. You'll not be faint. You'll rise up with wings as of eagles. You're not going to live like a little chicken pecking on the floor, wondering where the next meal is going to come from. You're going to be soaring on the thermals of God, soaring like an eagle, peacefully, not even, wo- not even moving your wings, no effort, just resting on the thermals to take you where you need to be taken. You'll rise up with wings as of eagles and all because of this wonderful component of peace that he wants to give. He comes here this morning into this place and he says, peace, peace. The Prince of Peace, it's only the Prince of Peace that can give us the peace that we need. It really is. Peace, my peace I give to you, Jesus said. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives do I give unto you. You see, he gives us the peace that we need. Paul understanding this in Philippians 4. He makes a statement which is great. He says, God is near. God is at hand. Do you know God is near? Sometimes it's hard for us to realize that. Sometimes it's hard for us to think on that. We don't feel that he's near. But let me assure you, God is near. God is close. And Paul, understanding this, he says, to the Philippians, he says, God is near. God is close to you. And then after that wonderful statement, he says, don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. There's a peace that passes understanding. There's a peace that that is so wonderful, that is so glorious, that you will never worry again. You will never fear anything. Once this peace is firmly in place in your life, there'll not be a worry, there'll not be a concern that will ever be able to captivate us. This is the peace that Jesus wants to diffuse to us. This is the peace that Jesus wants to give us. It really is. Why did these disciples in the years to come after this meeting, why did they go to the ends of the earth to tell people about Jesus? Why Did they give their lives so sacrificially to the cause of Christ? Why were they so tireless? Why did they just keep on keeping on and keeping on doing what they did? When you read about the amazing things that that these simple men did, simple women did for Jesus, why could they do it? I believe it was because of the meeting that they had with the Prince of Peace on this night. If they had, if Jesus had come into their midst and said, listen, you failed me, and as a result of failing me, now you have to work for the rest of your life to serve me. Do you know what? May have lasted a month, six months at best, and they would have been failing. If Jesus had come into the midst that night, into, into that room, 
and said, listen, Peter, it was you that denied me three times. It was you just days ago that said that you, would, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't back off. You'd stand with me. And what happened in front of everybody? You cursed my name. No, he didn't go in with that tact. He just went in, didn't even mention what had happened and the promises that had been made. Didn't even mention anything of the faithful lifestyles that they had led. Faithless lifestyles that they had led. Didn't even mention it. Just walks in. Peace. I tell you now, there's nobody like Jesus. Tell me any other religious leader that you can find in the history books that has ever even come near to being like that. There ain't one. And there will never be one. There is only one Jesus. There is only one Son of God. He is our Lord, reigning King forever, friends. I tell you now, there isn't anyone like Jesus. God's not angry. And it doesn't matter what religion tells you, he is. No, God is love. God is love. And he's demonstrated that love whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that we could have a relationship with him. He's wonderful, glorious, majestic. There's nobody like him. No, he didn't come to remind them of their sins. He came to give them peace because he loved them. And he'd said just days before them, as I have loved you, love one another. Love one another. Don't bring up each other's sins. Don't look at each other's faults. Don't get into quarrels and backbiting and gossip. Come. Paul, Paul taking this up in, in years after, just said, be at peace with all men. Don't get into fights and quarrels and strife with one another. As I have loved you unconditionally, love one another without condition. What a wonderful, powerful way to live. And he sets them free through this one word and through this one reality. Peace. Peace. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. We're going to close in just a moment. Nothing to worry about, church. Nothing to worry about. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the one that gives us peace. David said this, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging bread. That wasn't just a faith statement or a word confession. That was a reality of life an experience where he saw the faithfulness of God come into every circumstance when there was a time of need, a time of trouble, or even a crisis. He would, he would see God come in. What is your need today? What is the issue that's, that's causing your heart to ache? God's going to give you peace for that. He really is. He really is. He's going to give you peace right now we we'll close our eyes here this morning just take a moment today <clears throat> his peace will remove every trouble his peace conquers every fear and it doesn't matter what door we've locked ourselves behind to hide away from the Issues that we face, Jesus can come in through that restriction and that limitation. Give you his peace. Enable you to open that door and go confident into a world that you may know is against you. 
that you may know is not for you. But that peace will give you strength, security, and salvation. Is it a failure? You failed God. You failed yourself. You feel guilty. And you're wondering what God's response, God's word to you is today. You feel heavy hearted. Let me tell you, I'll tell you exactly what God's word to you is today. You want to know it? I'll give it to you. So it'll give you peace and not guilt. And it's this, the words of David. Lord, if you marked my transgressions, who would stand against you? But there's forgiveness with you. The reality of forgiveness will give you peace. Right now across this room, Father, if there's anybody with a heavy heart, a guilty mind, I thank you, Jesus. You carried our guilt. You carried our shame. You carried our sin. There's forgiveness with you. That's what your word says, and we believe it right now. For every troubled heart, Lord, I pray that your peace would rest on your people. Perfect peace. Perfect peace. In Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. All of those elements are the fruit of peace. Love, not fear, comes out of peace. A sound mind comes out of peace. So right now, Holy Spirit, I ask you in this moment to settle everybody's heart that would need it in Jesus' name. And Lord, if there's one person, you may be here today. And you may never have asked Jesus into your heart. Can I give you an opportunity right now to pray a prayer with me? Asking the Prince of Peace to come into your heart. You know, I said this before, it's a bit like driving a car. For years I was in the driving seat. And you know what? I wasn't a very good driver. I'd have head-on collision after head-on collision if I was in the driving seat of my life. But years ago now, I decided to allow Jesus to jump in the driving seat. And I go in the passenger seat, and I'm telling you now, life becomes a blessing. Life becomes fulfilling when we allow him just to simply take the driving wheel of our lives. Maybe today you'd like me to pray with you while eyes are closed in this moment. I want to pray a simple prayer so that you can ask Jesus to come into your life. If that's you, I want you to quickly lift your hand up. I'll pray with you. I'll see your hand and then you can put it down. Is there one person here this morning you want to ask Jesus into your heart? Great Paul. That's it. Put your hand up. I'll see it. And I'll pray with you. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, right now, I ask you to come into my heart. Please forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I ask you to take the driving wheel of my life so that I can follow you. I can be led by you. I believe that you're alive. You've risen from the dead. And I call on your name for salvation. Amen.